and I'm going to cover the overall structure of cognition but then go quickly into understanding how the computational theory of mind works and how that helps us understand questions of cognition. Any you know, cognitive science and the study of the mind is unlike, let's say, the study of quarks or the study of nanoparticles in a very essential way, which is that it's both simultaneously old and new at the same time. There is no sense in which a modern student of physics, if you're studying quantum mechanics now, you really don't have to pay that much attention to what Aristotle thought about quantum mechanics. In fact, he didn't think about quantum mechanics. But you do have to pay attention to what Plato and Aristotle thought about the mind. And that's a fundamental difference because it tells you that there is a continuity of concern and also a continuity of interest which is very old both in India and abroad. And therefore, there is still this weight of history and the weight of historical questions that informs the field that simply doesn't happen in many other fields. So you don't have to understand pre-1953 molecular biology all that much. So 1955 is when modern cultural science really starts. 1953 is where modern molecular biology really starts. But cognitive science is still you know, possible to quote Plato and Aristotle. It's simply not worth quoting either Plato or Aristotle to do molecular biology. So that's a very important historical constraint which makes us, therefore, ask the question, what is it that we are studying when we are studying the mind? And how is that, therefore, different from how Aristotle or how Nagarjuna studied the mind. That's a very um, controversial question, but one that we nevertheless should start our investigation from, which is that, again, the object of study for the cognitive sciences is always really our everyday experience of reality. So it is not unlike a technical field like string theory where even the object of study is inaccessible to most people. I don't know what an electron looks like, and unless you have a fancy machine, you can't even tell me what is it that you're studying. But for us, when we study the mind, it's an object of study that we all possess, for one. And we are all, at one level, experts. Meaning to say that your access to your own mind and your access to other people's minds, and perhaps your access to other species' minds, lies at the foundation of the field. You can't really say that about any other discipline at all in the sciences. In the humanities, of course, that's standard. If you are an Indian, you have access to Indian history in a way that, let's say, um, Americans don't have. Uh, that doesn't make you into an expert on Indian history, but at least you could say that there is that in you the um, history of your own country is embodied in some manner. You can't really say that about many other um, scientific disciplines. That somehow you, as an individual and as a subject, are actually not just a uh, lay person, but at some level you're also a expert. And this is a tension that runs through the field because at one level all of us have opinions about how the mind works. In fact, we spend a great deal of our time analyzing our own minds and probably more often so analyzing other people's minds. I mean, literally every single time some friend of yours does something that you don't like, what you're doing is a pre-theoretical form of the mind sciences. So which means that if I'm coming and telling you that somehow there's a different form of studying the mind, which isn't what you're already doing, and that you have to listen to me, what do you do? You can do one of two things. You know, I, I, and I will give you sort of a stereotyped version of the two answers. One answer is everything is in the Vedas, right? which is to say that uh, some ancient person somewhere 
so generically, so depending on which religious persuasion you come from, it, it, it is, uh, has many legs and many hands, or no legs and no hands. Uh, but be that as it may, it's like some ancient something has figured out the answer already, and all that is needed is to follow that. The other extreme is yesterday's neuroscience. Right? So what was discovered in some lab by shining a light on uh, somebody's uh, retina or actually peering inside their brain is the answer. So these are broadly speaking the two things that we all seem to think. And every day, I mean, if you read a newspaper, I mean, the one that I read, the Hindu, uh, has both of these represented every day. Right? In one page you will see yesterday's brain science tells us this, and then the next page there will be this thing that says, you know, some great sage somewhere said this. So Hindu is a wonderful <laughs> paper that way, it's uh, full of these contradictions. Okay? Now, that unfortunately doesn't give us much room for asking questions of our own. Because it means that whatever you do, it's either you have to refer to one kind of expert or another kind of expert. And so the only thing you could do is become one of those two kinds of experts. And that means your own ability to ask questions about the mind is compromised, which means that your conversation that you're saying, why is your friend behaving this way and that way, is no longer valid. So how do we combine this direct access that we have to the mind in some sense with the secondary forms of access that we have through the sciences or through whatever other disciplines? And that's, a, that's the question that everybody has ever always faced in trying to study the mind. And this dichotomy runs through the discipline even now which is to say that the tension as to where you are an expert, as a, as a person on the street, where you are an expert and where you are naive is answered differently in different situations. To give you an example, when we study language, now all of you have a mother tongue. Let's say that some of you have Hindi as a mother tongue. Again, within Hindi, it may be a particular form of Hindi. Others may have Tamil as a mother tongue yet others might have Gujarati, I don't know. So there's a, I'm sure in this room there are at least five to ten different mother tongues. So, linguistics, the way it has proceeded is our capacity to judge grammaticality, let's say, or meaningfulness of a sentence. We are all experts in our mother tongue. So if you are a Hindi, uh, speaker, the claim is that your access to when is a Hindi statement grammatical or not, that is the definition of what it is to be an expert as the first, you know, as the native speaker of Hindi. On the other hand, how does Hindi grammar work and why is it that Hindi grammar has certain uh, uh, features while English doesn't? You have no expertise there. Some expert linguist has to tell you why is it that Hindi has, you know, let's say compound verbs and English does not. Okay? So, this therefore, where do you become, as a researcher into the cognitive sciences, you are trying to be both. You are trying to be both the insider and the outsider. Right? You are trying to be the scientist who studies the mind. You are also a possessor of a mind who is reflecting on it from the inside. How do you combine the two? And this is a very, very hard problem because the boundaries are always shifting. So to give you an example, a great deal of research supposedly showed us that the mind is more or less fixed or the mind has very hard limits. So we can only remember up to seven items at a time in short term memory. It's a very famous Magic yeah, Miller's experiment, but the magic number seven is repeated again and again. Now, it turns out that if you do a lot of, let's say, certain kinds of meditation practices, your capacity to remember certain things is greatly expanded. So what does that mean? It means that first person inquiry is giving you evidence that 
supposedly contradicts the output of third-person scientific discovery. 